And that the world we live in today is that people believe all paths lead to heaven. You know, everybody's on a different path, and everybody ends up in the same place no matter what. But Jesus came and he says, no, I have moral authority in the universe. Yeah. And the greatest thing that you can do with your life is to invest in your relationship with God and to love people the way Jesus did. Yeah. How's it been going, investing in your walk with God? Is your heart fully invested in God this morning? Is your soul, your strength, your goals for your life, is it to love God more? Or is it to maybe love the world a little bit more? Maybe love yourself a little bit more? Or is our goal this morning to love God with all that we have and to truly be able to say, glory be to God. You know, to study out glory in the Greek, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's, in the Greek, it means opinion. Glory. The opinions go to God. The judgment calls, they go to God. What's right and wrong, that goes to God. If you study out glory in the Greek, it says judgment. If glory is to God, that means judgment belongs to God. The opinions that matter belong to God. The views that matter belong to God. The estimate, whether it's good or bad, concerning a person belongs to God. Magnificence and excellence all belong to God. You know, it's amazing that we're called to fulfill this. Jesus fulfilled it perfectly. And thank God we have a Savior. Because if I'm honest, I fall short of this every day. Yeah. Do all my opinions go to God? Does all my judgment go through God first? Do my views on the world, my views on people, when people say things against me, if people treat me a certain way, does the glory go to God in my life? Or am I putting the glory on myself and giving myself the authority to make my own decisions based on my own glory? Yeah. Glory has got to belong to God. Yeah. Now the question is, how do we get to a place where we love God with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength? How do we do that? Well, the first thing is, our first point today is, we must become consumed with God. We live in a world that says, no, everything in moderation. And yes, it's true for work and for relaxation and balance, but there should be no moderation in your love for God. Jesus doesn't say, love me when it's convenient. Love God whenever it fits into your schedule. No. Jesus says the greatest commandment, not the suggestion, but the commandment, is that we learn to radically love God more and more each and every day. Yeah. We've got to become consumed with God, if we are truly going to give Him the glory. Let's go to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We're going to take a look at Jesus' outlook on His relationship with God. See, Jesus said, man, maybe Jesus was just, did His own thing. Maybe just it was natural that it was just invested inside of Jesus that He just was kind of this robot who couldn't sin. That's not true. Let's look at Jesus' outlook on his relationship with God. In John chapter 5 and verse 30, the Bible says, By myself, I can do nothing. Wow, this is Jesus. Jesus can't do anything on his own. Look at this outlook in his relationship with God. By myself, I can do nothing. I judge only as I hear, and my judgment is just. For I seek not to please myself, but them who sent me. What was Jesus looking for? The outlook, the judgment? Why was it just? Because all the glory was belonging to God. Now I'd ask myself this morning is, can I say that by myself, I can do nothing? I can say that all day, but I have to ask, do I believe that? I woke up this morning and I was, I was asking myself this, because I prepared the lesson earlier in the week. And I woke up and I, I just said, oh, I hear the rain this morning. We're back in Oregon. There's no rain in California. I said, we're back in Oregon. Why can't I hear the rain? Because God's given me the ability to hear. Yeah. I smelled like a smell of a, an air freshener. Why do I smell that? God's given me the ability to smell. I can see. Why Why can I see the lights are on? Why can I see my cloak? Because God's given me the ability to see. I said, well, I really can't do anything without God. Why in the world would it make any kind of sense to not give Him back all the glory? By myself, I can do nothing. I want to challenge the church to start to believe this more and more. Maybe you're already saying, Pastor, I wake up believing this every day. Awesome, continue to believe it. What about your pastor? Come on, bro. 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 Come
that by yourself you can do nothing. You know, we live in a world that believes that we can do anything on our own. And the truth is we can do things, but as far as what matters for eternity, by ourselves we can't do anything. There's been millions and millions of people who've walked the face of this earth and in the eyes of God have done nothing. Isn't that crazy to think about? Busy bodies rather than being busy for the Lord. Because the greatest commandment is that we love God. It's not a suggestion, it's actually a command. This is what made Jesus' life so powerful. He literally believed that there was nothing he could do without God. Therefore, he can go forward. He says, my, ju my judgment is correct. We live in a world where we're scared of controversy. We're scared to stand up for something. We're scared to say, this is right. This is the moral truth. Because what happens? If you throw out the moral truth, there's 20 other opinions about what's right. But when all the glory goes to God, he doesn't have to make the right judgment about what's true. No. This is what's true because this is what God says is true. And I'm going to bring them all the glory. Let's go to John chapter 2. Remember that it is written, 
Zeal for your house will consume me. Then the Jews demanded of him, What miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do all this? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and I will raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, It's taken 46 years to build a temple, and you're going to raise it in three days? But the temple he had spoken of was his body. After his raised grace from the dead, his disciples recalled what he had said. Then they believed the scripture and the words Jesus had spoken. It's amazing. Jesus comes in, and Jesus just is able to look at a, a scene and judge it. Because all the glory belonged to God. His disciples were with him, and so his disciples weren't sure what was going on, but there was already an established economy, there was an established religion, there was an established norm of society that was going on. And Jesus was yet consumed with his zeal for God. And he says, I can't just go by the status quo. If I'm going to bring glory to God, I can't just go by fitting in with what other people are just doing. Yeah. And what did the disciples remember? Zeal for my Father's house will consume. They saw Jesus consumed with the zeal of God. You study out zeal in the Greek, it says it's an excitement of mind. I mean, Jesus walked into a fellowship, didn't matter where it was, he was just fired up in his mind to do the right thing for God. <laughs> he just walked in and said, I've got to do something about it, too. Now, Jesus always had tact. He didn't harm people. He didn't lay hands on people. He wasn't rude. He just took a great stance for God. Zeal, it's an excitement of mind. It's a fervor of spirit. Embracing, pursuing, defending anything that is correct. Wow. Wow. This is how Jesus lived his life. He was consumed with the desire to do what was right in the eyes of God. My question to us this morning is, are you consumed by God? Mm -hmm. I walk into situations sometimes that I'm not consumed by God. I'm just like a pedestrian. I'm a window shopper Christian. I'm like, hey, I see that's wrong, but I don't want to say anything. I'm not really consumed. Yeah. How many times do we go to our campuses? Do we go to our works? Do we go to different social settings and we're just not consumed? I mean, Jesus walked into this thing. He says, wow, I've got to stand up for what's wrong. Now, Jesus related to people and he loved people and he had to use great discernment. So I don't think we should go into like Starbucks and like start flipping tables in Starbucks. And, <laughs> no, it's at the temple. It was a very, you know, protecting the house of God. But are we consumed this morning that says, wow, I want to make it known what's right in the eyes of God with great tact, with great love, and with great concern, with a great zeal. Jesus' entire reputation was based on his zeal for God. You know, I, I had to ask myself, who am I when nobody's looking? Hmm. No. I'll ask you guys this, that this morning. Who are you when nobody's watching? I know who we are when we're at church. I know who we are when we're, we're hanging out. But who are you when everybody's gone? When the doors are closed, when the, the lights are out, when it's just you, who are you? That's the real test of who you really are. Yeah, you know, I'll be honest. For me, for a long time, I, when nobody's watching, I was a different person. I was a liar. I was impure. I was a drunkard. I, was, I, was, I, I could even be a thief at times. When nobody's watching, that's just that's what I was. You know, I study the Bible and I see Jesus. It didn't matter who he was around. He was consumed. He was with his disciples. He was consumed. He was with his family. He was consumed. He was with the religious world. He was consumed. He was on the cross. It wasn't Facebook Live. It was no Snapchat. There was no trumpets and glory. It was him and, and John and a few of the disciples and a bunch of people making fun of him. Who was Jesus when nobody was watching? You know, when nobody's watching, are you, are you excited about God? Are you in love with God that says, wow, even if nobody's watching, I'm not doing this for people. I don't come to church because people tell me to come to church. I come to church because I'm consumed by God. And the scriptures say, don't give up meeting together. And on the first day of the week, they met throughout the Bible. So we're just going to meet on the first day of the week. Why do we meet at 10 a.m.? We just agreed at 10 a.m. And so we're going to meet at 10 a.m. Yeah. December 22nd, we'll meet at 6.30 p.m. Why? We're just consumed. Come on, bro. But you got to ask, are you consumed this morning? When nobody's watching, are you a disciple of Jesus? You know, I had to learn some hard lessons because for me, even as a disciple, as a young disciple, I was deceitful as a young disciple. Remember there was a time that uh, 
it was good to see Colton and the Rums, and uh, they they uh, they trained Raleigh and I for for a long time in Boston, and uh, just have become stayed great friends. And uh, Colton has this uh, cart. It's one of those carts. They're real big on the East Coast, like New York, and they kind of like fold up. And you don't, not everybody has cars, so they're like for groceries, you go to the store, and you kind of have your own cart. Now, the wheels on this cart and the bearings were really loose, and so we went, to, we were serving this one brother, we picked him up from the airport, and Colton had the cart in his truck. And so I pulled the cart out, and we, you know, we went and picked up his bags, and we helped carry his bags with the cart, and um, he had a lot of stuff, so that's why he took a cart. And we got to the, the unload and we got the bags and all the carts and then I folded up the cart and I put it back in his trunk and I noticed there was like a click and something, I heard something fall, but I was like, this thing's kind of a piece of junk anyway, whatever, and I, I just left it there. Now, the next day, Colton was, came by and he's like, man, you know what, I was so bummed out, somebody broke our cart. And I was like, oh man, that stinks, you know? <laughs> I was so embarrassed. I wasn't consumed. I, I just wanted to look good in the moment. And so I was like, that my nature came to me. You won't really find out. But. So I was like, man, that's a bummer. And I didn't really answer the question, but I just kind of like acknowledged that I was concerned. Yeah. And then the next day, it just ate at me for like 20 hours. And I was like, why am I being this person? Nobody else in the world would know. It's only something that me and God knows. No, I can go my whole life. I can take it to the grave. Nobody would know about it. But I wasn't consumed. Yeah. I was consumed by my image. I was consumed with having this perfect record that I didn't break stuff or I didn't have accidents or I was just like this awesome guy that always did things great. And I was consumed by how I looked. And I remember going the next day to Colton's house. I said, bro, and his, his wife was at midweek. And he had, I, I heard the two kids screaming out of the apartment. They lived on the second floor. Just they were, one was sick and... You know, there's kids. And Colton's like just being super dad. And I was like, bro, I'm outside of your apartment. I'm going to sit here until I can talk to you for a couple minutes. And Colton came out and I was like, bro, I broke your car. I was the one who did it. I was like in tears. It was like, why? It was such a spiritual thing to be consumed. It's such a spiritual thing to be honest and to be real. And Jesus carried that around his whole life. He carried around integrity and honesty and, and truthfulness and real. Be real. He was consumed by God. Why do people not live up to their potential today? Secrets. Back doors. Skeletons in their closet. Can't be consumed with that. Our bodies are really that temple where the Spirit lives. And if we're trying to house the Spirit of God and sin and lies and deceit, what's going to happen? The house won't stand. Eventually, you'll, you'll, you'll follow one or the other. You'll get wide gut level open. You'll be honest. Be like, look, I'm consumed. This is who I am. This is what I've done. Maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe it was 20 years ago. But this is who I am, and I, I don't want to be different. And now you just start walking in a consumed life with God. You see God work through your life. You are deeply in love with God, and you become a beacon of hope for people in this world. On the other hand, we just kind of sweep things under the rug. We play church. Play Christianity. Sold out disciples. Evangelize the world. We give our missions. We give our contribution. Maybe we even share up in front of church. And hey, even I'm, I'm not above it. I gotta look at myself. Am I consumed? Am I walking in the light? I mean, imagine Jesus' perspective of people. 100 percent in the light. Why did he believe in every person he came across? Why wasn't he burdened by the blind guy? Why wasn't he burdened by the sick people? How could he put up with sick people all day? Because he was just focused on the glory of God. Are we consumed this morning? You know, my challenge to everybody here this morning is to become zealous for God. Yeah. Excited at an inner level, yeah. a mind level, a heart level, a soul level. If you need to get stuff out, get it out today. Confess it. Get it in the light. You know, hey, it's better to just get open about stuff and uh, to go through a healing process for maybe it's a month, maybe it's, even if it's years. Go through the healing so that you can be totally consumed by God. You can be fired about your walk. You can pray more. You can share with others about how incredible God is because you are consumed by God. Yeah. Point number two is everyone's called to give their best. Let's go to Genesis chapter 4. Now we live in a world where we're okay with getting wild. I love the resurrected Jesus. The resurrected Jesus, it says his eyes are fire. What, what 
what's amazing about fire? Fire gets through anything in the human life. Fire can just pierce through whatever facade we put up, and it will go straight to the core of what's going on. And that's the resurrected Jesus. That's the Jesus that's alive today. That's the Jesus that's going to come back on the clouds, and everybody's going to meet face to face one day. Is the eyes of fire Jesus? That's the glory that we're going to see. And we'll all have a personal meeting with God. Let's be consumed now so that when we meet God, everything will go well. We're all called to give our best. In Genesis chapter 4, you know, all of us come from different backgrounds. We all have different life experiences, whether we grew up with our parents or without our parents or a single parent, or maybe we grew up with, you know, maybe a sibling that went through a lot of hardship, and maybe you saw hardship. I don't know. Maybe you have some sort of a of health things going on. Everybody's different. But yet God calls everybody to give their best. We're all called to share this conviction. No matter what we share or don't share from growing up. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 1, the Bible says, Adam lay with his wife Eve, and she became pregnant. And gave birth to Cain, and she said, With the help of the Lord, I brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some fruit, some of the fruit from the soil as an offering to the Lord. But Abel brought fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked at favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouched at your door, desires to have you, but you must master it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, Where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, What, you, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out from me, to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Here we have the first offspring of people. Now Adam and Eve, they came from God. They are created by God from the dust of the ground and from Adam's rib, Eve was created. And now we have Adam and Eve come together and, and with the help of the Lord, they have Cain and Abel. It was amazing because the Bible says that Abel kept flocks, Cain worked the soil. Look how different these upbringings are. You now sometimes we think, oh, farm, everything on the farm is the same. No, working with the, the animals and working with the ground are significantly different. You face different hardships every day. You face different responsibilities. You face different challenges. And you, you face just a different life. Working with animals versus working with the ground. Now they were assigned different responsibilities, so they had different upbringings, so to say. They had different challenges in their daily walk. They had to go through and learn how to do different things differently. They went through different hardships. Come on, bro. It's amazing, though, that they had such different convictions. Now they both had a conviction to give. They did. But what was the difference? Cain brought some of the fruit and just gave it to portions of the firstborn and brought it before God. Well, in verse 6, or verse 5, I'm sorry, it says, On Cain and his offering, God did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. That's amazing. God didn't favor one or the other. He loved them both. That's the same for God. God looks at the world and says, God's created the world. God loves the world. Imagine John 3.16. It says, for, the, for God so loved the world. Imagine the things that God sees. All the rape. He sees the hardship. He sees the murder, the envy, and the jealousy, and the hatred. And, and God says, I love the world. I love each and every person. I'm willing to care about everybody. But what changed? Their convictions to love God were different. Abel said, I'm going to love God with the best that I have. Cain says, I'm going to bring whatever I have, maybe the leftovers, maybe just a portion of it, and I'm just going to give it to God as kind of a duty to give. Yeah. Now what happened? 
Now they go about their lives. Abel's got the blessing of God and the favor of God. I don't know what that means. Maybe it was just easier for him to do things. Maybe he just caught on quicker. Maybe he's just enjoyed his work. He was joyful all the time. You know, I see that joyful person, and if you're like not doing well, you're like, man, why are they so happy? <laughs> it's not fair. They're blessed. And all that. That's probably what, but what was going on with Cain? Cain was angry. He was downcast. Why was he angry and downcast? Because he didn't have the conviction to love God with all his heart. It's an amazing thing to realize. Is that we can get in a place where we're angry, we're bitter, we're downcast, we're just, we're stuck in life because we just haven't chosen to give our best to God. Now God's merciful. God doesn't say, oh, you're not going to bring your best, I'll cut you off, forget you. No, what does God do? God starts to disciple King. And God doesn't just say, hey, you don't give your best, you're cut off, you're not as good as your brother, you go feel bad about it. That's not what God does. Yeah. Look at how God disciples Cain. He says in verse 6, the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must master it. That was amazing. God didn't say, oh, Cain, okay, let me give you your convictions right here. No, God comes to Cain and he's, he just asks questions. You know, sometimes we just got to ask one another questions. Yeah. God didn't assume things. God already knew what was going on. But what does God do? He's trying to pump faith into Cain and say, why are you angry? Why are you downcast? Don't you know, if you do what's right, I'll accept you. Just come, just come and, and live according to what I've called you to do. God starts discipling him and building him up and giving him hope and giving him vision. But what happened? Cain wouldn't take it. God tells Cain all about the spiritual battle. He says, you know what? In this world, sin wants to have you. It's a spiritual battle. So what do you need to do? You need to master your sin. Isn't that amazing? God calls him to independently work on his relationship with God. You know, God disciples him and calls him to master his sin. Sometimes we want our disciple to master our sin for us. Mm -hmm. We say, oh, I can't master my sin because my disciple is not brilliant. They don't give me the right scriptures. Um, they don't say the things that I need to hear. That's not what God did to King. God didn't even bring these scriptures to King. He says, if you do what's right, and you've got to master your own sin. Now, the same thing for each and every one of us is you are responsible for your relationship with God. Yeah. Each and every one of us, we will be before God individually one day. Yeah. Your church leader won't be there. Your, your friends won't be there. Your, your greatest role model won't be there. If you're married, your husband, your wife won't be there. It will just be you and God. And that's what God was preparing Cain for is saying that, hey, look, in this world, it's a spiritual battle and sin wants to take you over. Come on. But you've got to master your sin. I mean, how's it been going? Are you waiting on your disciple to, to master your sin? Wow. I believe that sometimes people won't say that, but people really do believe that their disciple needs to help them get out of their sin. Yeah. I, I'm telling you, it's not true. God's given us discipling, and, and that's why in Matthew 28 says, go make disciples, baptize them, and teach them to obey everything. He doesn't say force them to obey everything. It's your responsibility for them to obey everything. No, he says teach them to obey everything. I think a lot of times people walk around with this victim mentality that says, because of how I grew up, because my disciple doesn't give me the best spiritual advice, I'm justified in my sin. I'm going to keep living in my sin because of you. It's because of the previous church leader. It's because of the current church leader. It's because of Kim. That's why I'm still in my sin. No, God will have a nice one-on-one -on -one talk with you and say, this is a spiritual battle. I'm calling you to be loving. I'm calling you to be forgiving. I'm calling you to make disciples. I'm calling you to go baptize people. I'm calling you to reach the nations. I'm calling you to have a world vision. And that's on you. Come on. I'm going to give you people in your life to help you. But no, it's up to you. Yeah. And sadly, what happened with Cain? Cain didn't want to take the challenge. Cain said, you know what? I'll take things in my own hand. And he goes and he kills Abel. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't master our sin. We end up doing things we never thought we would do. Yeah. Maybe your sin is just, it's, it's a little thing, you know? Maybe it's just, I have lustful thoughts. 
And you know, if my disciple doesn't give me the greatest advice, and it's because of my past that, that, that I have lustful thoughts. And therefore, since my disciple or my church leader doesn't give me all the right answers, I can't help it. So then I watch pornography, and then I, I get to the place where I, you know, I found out that I, I got with a, a, a man or a woman, and then before you know it, something crazy is going on. Yeah. That's not on your disciple. That's not on your church leader. That's on you. And God will call you to master your sin, but you've got to ask, are you giving God your best? How did this all start? Abel said, God, I'm going to give you my best. You're the one who's given me the ability to raise these animals. You know, you're the one that's given me my health, my ability to work. I'm going to give it back to you from the first fruits of what I have. What did Cain do? Yeah, I know I need to give to God, so I'm going to give. It's not my best, but I'm going to give something back. God's not looking for something. God wants your best. But are you willing to love God with all your heart and give Him the true glory and give your best to God? Yeah. You know, all of us are going to leave a legacy. Yeah. You may say, hey, Abel only got 12 verses in the Bible. <laughs> now you read through Matthew, Jesus talks about Abel. <clears throat> read through Luke, Jesus talks about Abel. You read the Hall of Faith in Hebrews 11, it says the righteous blood of Abel still screams out today. What you do, who you are, the legacy you leave spiritually, people will rest on it for generations. They'll be inspired by it, or it will rob their faith. Let's leave a legacy that we give God our best, and we make His name known. Let's go to Luke 14 as we close out. Here in Luke chapter 14. You know, Matthew 22 is the parallel account here. We're going to pick up here in verse 15 with the, the parable of the great banquet. And in Matthew 22, it's awesome because Matthew 22, it says the kingdom of heaven is like. And so we know this is a parable that's relating to the kingdom of heaven. And what does the Bible say in Luke 14 and verse 15? It says, when one of those at the table with him heard this, he said to Jesus, blessed is the man who will eat at the feast in the kingdom of God. Jesus replied, a certain man was preparing a great banquet and invited many guests. At the time of the banquet, he sent his servant to those who had been invited Come, for everything is now ready. But they all alike began to make excuses. The first said, I've just bought a field, and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen, and I'm, I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. So another said, I just got married, so I can't come. The servant came back and reported to his master. Then the owner of the, the house became angry and ordered his servant go out quickly into the streets and alleys of the town and bring the poor, the crippled, the blind, and the lame. The blind and the lame. Sir, the servant said, what you ordered has been done, but there's still room. Then the master told his servants, go out to the roads and country lanes and make them come in, so that my house will be full. I tell you, not one of those who are invited will get a taste of my banquet. Mm -hmm. That's awesome, here. I mean, this is a parable about the kingdom of heaven. I mean, we're learning about eternal spiritual truths and... And what people realize, man, blessed is the person that's going to be able to be a part of this in heaven. Yeah. I mean, people were fired up about it. And how does Jesus liken the kingdom of heaven? He says it's like a certain man who was preparing a great banquet. You know, it's amazing. Since God made mankind, God's made mankind to be in a relationship with him. Yeah. On his terms. Not mankind's terms. God's terms. What did God do when he created Adam and Eve? He gave them rules. We live in a world, I don't know how it's gotten to this place today, even in Christian, Christian churches today, that there's just this freedom of whatever you want because there's forgiveness. Show me that in the Bible. Yeah. God made Adam and Eve and he gave them restrictions. True. Try raising a kid with no restrictions. Yeah. <laughs> Try running a business with no rules. Try having a class with no rules. Try going to the grocery store with no rules. Yeah. I don't know if you went to the Black Friday shopping. I <laughs> That's a little taste of what it looks like. And there's still rules. Yeah. That's not how God operates. God, God's given us His Word. He says, this is what matters. I'm preparing this for people. God's been preparing His kingdom since He's made mankind. Yeah. You even read through the time of, of, with Moses. He says, I've made this nation to be a kingdom of priests. God's made a kingdom. What, we get, you get into Isaiah. God, the kingdom's going to come. It's going to be established. 
You get into Daniel, so it's going to time in, in the time of the Roman Empire, it's going to be established. All the nations are going to be able to be a part of it. And Isaiah says, you get to the place where John the Baptist said, the kingdom is close, man. Jesus said, it is near. Jesus went to the cross, and in Acts 2, we see the kingdom that's been prepared since the beginning. Now come to earth, and if people repent and became true disciples, they can be baptized into Christ for the forgiveness of all their sins. They can now have God's spirit. They can be devoted to building the kingdom. God's been preparing this for a long time. But what's going on in this parable? He invited so many people. Yeah. God's made it known to the world. It's my son. He's the Lord. He's the one that he's got the final authority. And he's taught how to be able to be a part of his kingdom. He's prepared it. But what happened? In verse 18 it says, But they all like begin to make excuses. It's amazing how the Holy Spirit wrote this. He didn't say, all like they had great reasons why they couldn't be a part of the banquet. God's, God's not trying to negotiate with people like to be able to come to God on, on a negotiation terms. God says, no, this is what it means to be a part of my kingdom. I've laid it out in the word. Like This is what it is. And what happened? People started to make excuses. Now let's look at some of these excuses. Because I dare say that in the 21st century, these are legitimate reasons that pastors, that churches, that groups excuse for people not to put God first. See, this is radical. You've got to be consumed by God to be a part of God's kingdom. Let's look at these excuses. Verse 18, but they all like to make excuses. The first said, I just bought a field and I must go see it. Please excuse me. Okay, so you buy a field. That's a lot of responsibility. It's like starting a business. If you don't take care of your field, nobody's going to go take care of your field. If you don't plant stuff, if you don't build it, how are you going to make it fruitful? Yeah. How's it going to be ready to, to produce a crop if you don't go and just take care of your field? Now, are these things bad? No, they're not bad, but they shouldn't become excuses not to put God's kingdom first in our lives. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's keep on reading. Another said, I've just bought five yoke of oxen. And I'm on my way to try them out. Please excuse me. I don't know why he bought the oxen. Maybe it's he was going to help the guy in the field and they had a business agreement. I don't know. Maybe he just liked oxen, so he's going to have a, maybe it was a hobby. Five yoke of oxen, ten oxen, ten ox. Those things are huge. Yeah. They require a lot of work. Yeah. And Jesus says, if you're going to make that the reason you can't come to the kingdom, that's an excuse. Even though it is a lot of work. Verse 20, still another said, I just got married, so I can't come. Yeah. Wow. That makes sense, right? I mean, you get married, you have all these responsibilities, and no, it's an excuse. Our marriages should be marriages that are that flourish in the kingdom. Yeah. Our marriages should be marriages that we're able to go and we're able to build up the kingdom together. Well, the servant came back and reported this to the master. Then the owner of the house became angry. He realized that you have the ability to make God angry. That's how much God loves each and every one of us. That when we don't put him first, it actually makes him bother. The Bible says in the beginning, during the time of Noah, that, that God's heart was, it was hurting. It was grieved because people chose their lives in the world over God. And God just lays these out as excuses. Yeah. I mean, bought a field, this is like work, this is business. Five yoke of oxen, responsibilities, hobbies. Married, just life's too busy. Social. You know, just responsibilities in a marriage and learning. Aren't these the reasons why people don't put God first today? Yeah. Isn't, is, is anything different? Yeah. We live in a world that's prioritized fame and success and money and comfortability over God. Yeah. Now, none of these things are bad, but it shouldn't take the place of prioritizing God. We've got to love God with our heart, mind, and soul, and strength. Amen. You know, we live in a culture that doesn't teach this. And I was blown away... Uh, you know, it's been amazing being here at the VMA. Um, the church as a whole has influenced um, so many people that come through this building. Um, whether it's Peggy, who coordinates, the, runs the whole facility. Bob, who was the director here for about 20 years, who built this, this room. I mean, Bob's made numerous donations to the church. And, and, and in tears, he says, this, you guys remind me of the love of my late wife. And it's amazing to see the kingdom is beautiful. If we put it first, we make it beautiful. You know, it's amazing. One of the guys who, who teaches salsa classes in here, he, he runs yearly as a, for, as a politician uh, for office. 
And I got a call from a, just a random number earlier in the week, and I called him back. We kind of played phone tag. We finally got connected yesterday. And uh, his name's Robert. He says, hey, I run for office every year. And uh, I teach salsa. He said, if I, if I actually got the office position, it would really put a damper on my family because it only pays 30 grand a year, is what he said. And so he said, I'm not actually hoping to win. I'm just hoping to influence the city. Mm -hmm. So that's awesome, man. Yeah. Um, so what's going on? <laughs> he said, you know, I've, I've met you guys. I saw when you guys came, your plates were out of state. So I don't think you're uh, partial or biased to just Oregon, but you, you're biased to what's right. And I said, oh, yeah, absolutely. I have an obligation to uphold what the scriptures teach. Uh, this, is my, this is my obligation. And, so, and he says, well, well with that, I, I run for office. And I look at the world today, and he says, it's, it's horrible. Church and state is so far separate that, that they're almost like repelling magnets. Mm -hmm. and, and he just says, I, I, can't, I can't stand for it anymore. Mm -hmm. There's no moral vocabulary in our, in our, in our government today. Yeah. He said, this is what I need help with. I've met many people in the group. This is an incredible group. A group of joy and integrity and love. And he says, you know what? I, I want to be able to put a lot of biblical content together for my speeches. And I'd like for you and I to be able to sit down to be able to, so that I can really share this stuff appropriately according to the scriptures. Wow. He said, absolutely. I said, you know what? We could even get together and do some great Bible studies. <laughs> and and he, said, he said, you know, I don't, my time is very limited, so it'd have to be very deep stuff. And I said, oh, I got you. Well, we'll make sure that we have some very, very deep Bible studies. <laughs> but, but here's what he said. He said, look, I've done a lot of things in this world. I don't know how to leave my family spiritually. I don't know. I know how to make money. I know how to be able to, to run things. I don't know how to help my family get to heaven. He said, that's awesome. Let's get together. He said, I'm going to send you my free times. I want to get together. I want to make sure the content brings the right message from the Bible to the community. He says, even if I don't win, I'm going to go down really sharing this stuff. Wow. I said, what is that a result of? It's not... Anybody, it's not anybody individually, it's it's the kingdom. Yeah. Why are we called to seek first the kingdom? God's ready to do great things. God's ready to, to change the city. He's ready to change our campuses. He's ready to change our families, our workplaces. God's ready to. But we can't make excuses about why God's not the most important part of our life. And it's amazing as we do. You know, I was won over by people who God was their number one priority. I was never won over by somebody who made excuses why God wasn't first. Yeah. What happened? We had tension though. Because God wasn't my number one priority. And when I sat down with people and God was their number one priority, we didn't see eye to eye. Yeah. Yeah. So what happened? I had to change. I was fired up to change too. Because now I can, I can look at the scripture and say, yeah, am I perfect and, and seeking God with all my heart? No, I'm not. I need to learn to love God with all my heart more. With all my soul, I need to learn how to take all of the strength that I have and to love God. I'm not there yet, but I know that's the most important thing. On, and I've got to look at myself every day. Am I giving God my best? Yeah. Does my life bring the glory to God? And that's what all of us need to ask ourselves. You know, the kingdom's amazing. We have kingdom parties, and we invite all kinds of people to kingdom parties. Yes. And they see the love of the disciples. Yes. We have Bible talk, we invite all kinds of people, and they come to Bible talk. I was so proud of the. University of Oregon campus group uh, that Spencer led on um, on Tuesday when we were out of town, and it sounded like they had about five new uh, faces that came out to hear the word preach and to be able to see the love of the disciples and hear the, hear the scriptures. You know, we have sharing where we go and we, we reach out to countless people on a daily basis. Global leadership conferences where we see people get baptized, we see the word preached from all over the world. Winter workshops like we're going to have in January 5th through the 7th in Seattle. Yes. Missions conferences all over the world. Come on. Discipling times, deep relationships. There's a greatness, but the kingdom is what we make. Yeah. Why does God call us to give our best to the kingdom? Because God does something incredible in it. God works in a very powerful way. Now, the question I'll leave us with is, have you been giving your best to God? If you look at your giving, you give from your first fruits... Or do you give some of the fruit? Wow. Right, it comes to a conviction is why do we give? Yeah. Why? Mm -hmm. I give because God's called us to give. Mm -hmm. I know why I give what I give. And I have a conviction about it. Now you can send a hundred people to come talk to me about my giving, and I can tell you why I give what I give. Come on. I used to just, man, I'd 
give my first fruits to the to maybe the bar, or to the restaurant, to the mall for myself. And then I kind of, what do I have today? Crinkled up the dollar, put that in the plate. I feel great about myself. I can't. No wonder I was getting deeper and deeper in my sin. I had no convictions. Yeah. Do you give your first, first fruits in your giving? In your schedule? When you look at your life, do you give your first fruits to God? You know, I think a lot of times people give their prime time to Netflix. You know, your prime time when you're you're awake and you're alert and you're strong. Now there's nothing wrong with enjoying entertainment. But you gotta ask, are you giving your best to you in your schedule? Yeah. In your priorities to God? In your purpose? You know, we've been uh, really emphasizing the fight for someone campaign here in Eugene. And what's the whole purpose of it? Is that we're fighting for people. We give our hearts, we reach out to people, we encourage them. We, our hope is to sit down and share in the scriptures what we've learned. I'm so excited when I get to study the Bible with someone. For the first time, they look at scriptures. I can't tell you how many times we've sat down and, and I've heard people pray their first prayers ever. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're doing in this world. We're helping people become spiritual to love God with all they have. Come on. You know, who are you fighting for right now? That's amazing. People are, are kind of open during the holidays. I love sending messages to people in the holidays. A lot of times people respond back. They, they never respond, but then they say, oh, I'm out of town, so I can't come. I was out of town, too, so I was just reaching out to people to, to follow up with them. But, but, but i got to say, am I fighting for people? You send somebody a text message that says, hey, I just was thinking about you. I was praying for you. Uh, I believe in you. God has incredible plans for your life. I hope we can sit down and have coffee sometimes. Yeah. Even if somebody doesn't respond to that, I mean, you read that, and you're just like, man, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> And we're fighting for people. Maybe you need to send four or five of those messages. The guy who baptized me, I mean, he was reached out to multiple times. Right? Colton. It's taken like seven or eight times to get reached out to at work before he finally came to church. Now he's an evangelist leading all the undergrads in ICCM in LA and he's overseeing churches. Yeah. What happened? Somebody fought for him. Yeah. The guy who got serious. This guy reached out to him seven times at work before he came to church. He came to church, he became an incredible disciple, and now he's preaching here today. Come on. It was awesome uh, to see, uh, doesn't get old. Kelvin got baptized. Wasn't that awesome? Yeah. Come on, man. Fight for someone. You know, it was amazing to see Phoebe get baptized. Come on. See Leslie get baptized. Yes. Yes. See Leslie. I mean, it was awesome that Kevin placed membership here just about a month ago. It was awesome today that Ryan placed membership oh, here. Yeah. We got some more fighters here in Eugene. Yeah. But you got to ask yourself, are you going to devote to giving the glory to God? Simply how you do it. You get consumed by God, you give God your best, and we'll see God move in a powerful way. And to Him, you